Hello and welcome um, to this lecture on natural principles. Um, so permaculture encourages us to make observations of nature, to let nature be our teacher. Um, and I, I, I found that a very interesting challenge or interesting approach uh, for many, many years. And as I go around through life and travels, I, I've tried to think about that and, yeah, and kind of spot examples, ask myself, what am I seeing as I, as I walk around? And is this in some way um, telling us something about the sort of natural ebbs and flows and patterns that, that we see in the natural world? So this, this, is, this is sort of like some raw material, if you like, to inform us in our permaculture thinking. And I think it's good to look at these ideas early on as we, as we begin our permaculture journey. And also I'm going to say, I'm going to challenge you to make your own observations and you know, build up your own observations of, of these sort of, um, you know, what nature does all by itself. That's what always sort of fascinates me and, and sort of asking fundamental questions about that as well. And I think so permaculture, obviously principle one, observe and interact and you know, kind of asking questions, observing with an open and critical eye. So um, I might break this up. There's quite a lot of uh, ideas in this presentation. So I'll, I'll kind of put it into bite-sized chunks and we can work our way through it. But I think this is essential kind of raw material for, for thinking about permaculture. And certainly from the, uh, the, the Sector 39 PDC, which we're on. So, um, okay. Um, I was interested to see different kind of definitions of permaculture and maybe visualizations because it's a complex thing um here we have a nice de definition of uh, permaculture as a design system for ecological and sustainable living integrating plants animals buildings people and communities so we kind of like that um i mean let's think about how obviously with permaculture it's about how we meet our needs and also understanding how we interact with the natural world so, um, you know, climate, water, soil, uh, are what give us our food. Um, organization, other people, um, the economy, you know, give us access to shelter, to energy, you know, to, to those other, other core things that, that we need. Um, so we're trying to think holistically in permaculture. And then, then perhaps in, in looking into the natural world, what might that tell us about these things and about um, you know, climate, energy, and soil and water and food and, and, and so forth. These are, these are key questions. Um, so this is uh, an observation I made um, for a while ago, previous winter. This is a field, uh, an agricultural field. It's been harvested late in the year and the crops have been removed. It was maize, which was grown as a biomass crop. The maize has been removed and nothing has replaced it. So the farm has remained empty with bare soil all winter. That soil, you can see it's been compacted by uh, agricultural vehicles going in and out of the field. And with no plants growing on it, we've got a lot of surface water flow and consequently we're seeing you know, literally topsoil washing away. Uh, clearly nature does everything it can to sort of prevent these these processes and 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 our farming patterns and way that we farm are constantly stressing the soils damaging them and ultimately reducing their ability to retain and hold moisture which causes this kind of erosion now these are things that we don't want to see um nature tries to keep soil covered not bare and this is the reason. So I think this is a, something which we really want to take into our permaculture design uh, methodology is how can we prevent having bare soil and disturbing soil as much, you know, keep that absolutely to a minimum or can we reduce it? Can we remove it altogether? So we are a carbon-based life form. Um, the, the, and we share that in common with just about every other living thing. And that carbon is cycling through the atmosphere, through plants and animals, soils, um, constantly. 
it's it's the building block of life and that something about when we observe you know we observe nature uh we see life everywhere um so this is just this is a this is a this is uh, taken on the seashore in scotland um and we're just looking at barnacles they're a very simple form of crustacean it means they belong to the same family as crabs and lobsters but they're a kind of a shell and and they're little filter feeders and yeah you see them adhering here to these stuck onto these rocks so that shell is made from calcium carbonate so it's calcium and carbon and it's just a reminder really about how life is an interaction um is is joining things together it's building more complex molecules from simple um from more simple things so there's a process and it seems that as life progresses it incorporates carbon uh into itself and, and consequently into the into the into the into the into the landscape and over time as evolution has progressed and as time has progressed um this sequestration and stacking away of carbon has helped stabilize the climate so we can see we're looking at you know just a small detailed thing here but actually in some way that's connecting us also back to the whole so perhaps another thought is in nature to think about how everything is in some way connected to everything else so um yeah so these are barnacles a little kind of uh filter feeding a uh, uh, sort of sh uh, uh, shellfish of some kind um and actually, there's, there's there's a lot of these kinds of things in in the oceans, and for a very very significant a component of this is actually going on at a microscopic level. So these are actually diatoms, uh, and they're really tiny little microscopic organisms that actually have a little soft uh, calcium carbonate shell around them. And as they live and die, that shell is deposited on the sea floor, and ultimately get becomes incorporated into rocks and becomes part of the, of the fabric of the of, of, of the landscape. So here we're literally looking at um, the White Cliffs of Dover, the very famous White Cliffs of Dover in England. And uh, we're actually made out of these just little shells, these little tiny crust uh, shells of these little single cell organisms, diatoms. Um, and so what we're seeing there is an, uh, it's a build-up over a hundred million years. These incredibly long timescales. So it's also interesting for us to think about the timescale that the landscape around us might have evolved in. And in contrast to that, us coming along with our farming techniques or something um, and having an impact in a very, you know, much shorter time frame. So that's a, a, a thing to consider. Um, so what is known by the sort of the evolutionary timeline is that uh, life began in water and um, life began, the first early life forms happened on shallow, in shallow waters on the sort of coastal areas when you can imagine a kind of a super perhaps of nutrients uh, 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 being available there. And then organisms evolving that can floating in that they're able to sort of take advantage of that. And what we're looking at here is algae. These are unicellular, very simple, the simplest form of plants. And um, it's also interesting to note that plants began life in the sea, in water. So without roots. And at some stage in the evolutionary timeline, um, there was a colonization of the land. And it's very interesting to think about how that has come about and to also understand that we are the inheritors of that process, if you like, um, the, the long-term beneficiaries. As, as, as life moved from the sea onto land, um, opened all sorts of new possibilities. So and what we're seeing here in these little algae is you can see um, a, a sort of a shell around the outside and um, uh, a cell wall and inside some green stuff. 
And of course, that green stuff is chlorophyll. And that is the, the structure that the plant uses to convert sunlight into sugar. And what plants can do, and what virtually no other organism can do, is use the energy is to, to tr use the energy of the sun to join carbon dioxide and and water molecules together, which is a simple form of sugar. Um, so immediately when we observe, look into the natural world, and we start to understand, uh, identify things like individual algae or our uh, 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 um, uh, diatoms. Uh, as we look a bit further into it, what we realize is that these things, these um, creatures don't, and organisms don't necessarily, don't live in isolation, that they interact with each other. Now, the way that plants were able to begin to find a way to colonize onto the land was by teaming up with fungi. And here, what we're actually looking at is a lichen. Uh, under the microscope. Lichens, I'm sure you've all seen, here's some growing on a wall in, in the UK. And it's a composite organism. It's a symbiotic organism of fungi and an algae living together in the same structure. So as you can see in this picture, the, um, the, the, the actual structure of the organism and protecting it is coming, is provided by the fungi. And then here's the algae within it which is photosynthesizing and giving sugars to the plant, to the, um, to the fungi. And the fungi can access, literally access minerals by dissolving them into the rock and pulling out minerals, which then is exchanging with the plant for sugar. And this, this kind of relationship, the mutually beneficial relationship is something that is typified within nature and natural systems and um it's a it's an interesting important thought for us to begin to think about how uh, species join together and cooperate in certain ways um to to, to survive to be able to be able to uh, uh flourish and and go forward so um this this you know we don't have to join and draw any conclusions at this point but i think we're learning something we're seeing something about the way that nature's that the more complex systems are built on collaboration and and also i think what we're seeing is that over time the living and dying of um organisms has actually moderated and changed the conditions on earth and quite possibly in the process of doing that has favored life on earth. So we're seeing processes where different organisms are collaborating in certain ways, uh, for, 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 uh, which, which opens up the realm of possibilities for them. It's really, really interesting to consider in that way. So also there's, there's this an idea, which is very important, which also is, Nature doesn't tend to stay, stay stand still, and it kind of abhors a vacuum. So look here, we've got um, a, literally a vertical wall, and um, you can imagine rain falling on that, the rain would pass through that very, very quickly. But now that there's um, algae living there, there's, sorry, now there's the lichens living there, some of that moisture will be held and stay around longer, and facilitate the, the, the lichens to grow a bit more. And at the same time, as they live and also die, and they weather those the rocks, the, the rock face that they're on, then they start to contribute um, elements, which then will form humus and compost, and be actually the very beginning of the soil building process. As rock is weathered and organic matter is is accumulated, some of that can fall down through gravity, and 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 create the opportunity perhaps for slightly more complex organisms to appear. So here we have moss, um, that this moss has the ability to hold more moisture, to have more surface area, has more physical body to it, more biomass. So this is going to in some way create more habitat perhaps for other microorganisms, um, slow down the passage of water. And whilst at the same time as it lives and dies, it's helping contribute to soil building. All of these things are essential. 
Um, and you can think about this as a sort of as like a conveyor belt, a, 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 a process of succession starts a very tough, small uh, organisms that, that, you know, that can, if you like, pioneer and begin a process and then followed in the footsteps, maybe other kinds of plants might come along that enjoy benefits of what, you know, the opportunities that have been opened up by the, the primary uh, colonizers as pioneer species. So even on bare rock, we see pioneering going on and maybe different forms of mosses might come along. This is a sphagnum moss, which can hold very much more water and create a lot more habitat and build more organic matter. So, you know, the one enables the other to come. Um, so in a typical uh, uh, temperate woodland or te and the, and the, and the um, this, this process of succession begins with annual plants. It brings with plants that can grow in one season and leave seeds behind. And as they live and die and live and die, you begin to build the soil and build the soil structure and, and hold on to nutrients and sort of cycle nutrients to make them available for more hardier, longer term, longer term living plants. Here we're seeing some grasses and some bigger herbaceous plants coming in. And then slowly we might get woody plants, um, small bushes and shrubs, uh, plants that maybe that, that, that grow all year round or, 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 um, or have much bigger structures. Um, we might have some quicker growing trees and then followed by a long term final sort of. Uh, sort of the canopy trees. And what we can see is that. Um, as the system moves from one side to the other, things are here are living and dying very, very quickly. And there's a lot of um, nutrient exchange going on. But at this end, there's a lot more biomass. There's a lot more habitat. There's a lot more surface area. But as our systems tend to mature, they also tend to slow down their rate of growth and then eventually become almost um, in equilibrium. So there's an interesting transition and there's some point along this successional line where we might say there's the optimum amount of growth. There's the, so the, there's the maximum amount of uh, solar gain, a solar trapment. Um, and see so again, think about the, the time scales as we move through. The, the, these, the, the, the first pioneer plants might just live for a few weeks and months and then maybe a year or two. And, um, and as we progress into it, things that live, you know, ultimately live a very long time and create long term stable conditions. Um, so there's a, a kind of a time stacking element as as a system develops, it becomes more permanent. I mean, it becomes more permanent. There's opportunity to build deeper, more complex soils and provide habitat for many more different kinds of organisms. We can observe this. Everywhere we go, which where land is perhaps being cleared and where it starts to grow back, we're actually starting to see that successional process. And it's good to start to identify what those plants are. What are these in your home area? What are these pioneer plants that come up first that can break new ground or bare ground and, and perhaps begin to establish the way for, for others to come in? They're often thorny and spiky. Um, they often have to defend themselves from grazing animals. And, um, and so this leading edge of the succession is something that we want to work with a lot in permaculture, as we want to repair damaged ground and, and bring it back to life and bring it back into productivity. And then once we've done the, that first stage, we're very interested again, is what comes, what, what follows on in the footsteps, what types of plants, what kind of uh, functions do they perform, and you know, how do they grow? And how do they relate to other organisms? But all of this comes in time. And I'm really just encouraging you to open your eyes and to take more notice of things as you move around and observe what is going on in your locality. So carbon, carbon, carbon. We're talking about carbon. Let's stay on this a bit because it is it is very, very important. So here's... here's um. It's, this is, these numbers are from the 19, from the 1990s, so they're a bit out of date, but doesn't the overall pattern uh, is what's important. 
So let's just look at this middle section. What we're saying is the complete picture of the carbon cycle. So in, in a year, approximately, the growth of plants on land draws down 450 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. 450 billion tonnes, that's a lot. And But those plants and those forests and those living systems that are, that are pulling that um, carbon dioxide down and obviously building into their structure, they're also being eaten. They're also being felled. They're also you know, dying and, and, and dropping leaves and, and, and so forth. So some of that carbon is being returned to the atmosphere. And there's a kind of a constant return as well. But what we can see is, figures as of the 1990s, um, there's actually a net sequestration. There's a net locking away of about 6 billion tonnes a year. OK, don't worry about the numbers. Which, what's interesting is, is, is the proportion. So uh, uh, long term stable ecosystems stack away carbon, but not lots, not a lot. Uh, it's, it's very significant and very important. And of course, if they weren't there, um, they have a negative effect. But um, so as the system matures, it becomes a bit more sort of carbon neutral. But there is a net sequestration. And when we look at the sea, it's the same. Um, um, we're seeing a very similar pattern at 338 billion tons, apparently, carbon dioxide drawn in by aquatic life. Um, and as, as also as it lives and dies and incorporates the carbon molecules into its structures and bodies, and of that, 332 million tons is returned as carbon dioxide. And the 6 billion net there is obviously falls to the seafloor, and that becomes your calcium carbonate, your your limestones and other sort of organic materials and so forth. So, um, and of course, what's happening in the forest in the uh, living systems here is that net, that six billion tons of carbon is ending up in the soil. It's translocating through the plants into the soil where it becomes a long term asset. So I think one of the things that we need to understand is that the the, the place to store carbon in the long term and in terms of addressing our climate change uh, 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 responsibilities is in good, healthy soil. And this is a theme we'll be coming back to many times over on the, the permaculture course, because carbon rich soil is exactly what you want when you're farming. So um, that's why a lot of our techniques are based around building up that the, a carbon rich soil. Now, so over time, over many millions of years, um, the natural systems on Earth have stacked away carbon into the soils and into literally into the bedrock. Uh, and then along came humans and we started digging up some of those stored forms of carbon, including coal, gas and oil and, and also burning uh, trees for, for energy. And we've now become a significant emitter of, of these uh, turns out to be greenhouse gases and um we're uh, we are uh, not only we're emitting them faster than the planet can suck them you know sort of uh, sequestrate them away is we're emitting them at an ever increasing rate so there it talks about 23 million tons of human emissions i now happen to know that we're now at 40 million tons of human emissions here we are in 2023 now so this is the big picture thing that we all need to kind of understand. And if there's a take home from this, it's to understand that the kind of farming that we have to do has to stack away carbon into the soil. And we want to rely ever less on fossil fuel burning for our own energy needs. So that's, again, this is the big picture. So I use this word, trans, oops, I use this word translocation. Um, and we're going to look at soils more deeply uh, as we go forward. Obviously, it's a very, very important subject. And but let's just say for now is that as you go deeper down into the soil, uh, the conditions change. And you can have different soil horizons depending on uh, the climate type zone that you're in. They can vary. Um, but that in this sort of temperate example, 
they talked about so the the O horizon, which is where the the bit that's rich in oxygen and full of uh, aerobic life forms and lots of organic matter um, that builds up in healthy soils and that's interacting with plants. And then, of course, um, many of the microbes within the uh, 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 horizon of the soil will also be aerobic like us, which means they breathe in oxygen and they breathe out CO2. So there's some CO2 respiration coming from that uh, from that layer. And of course, the more the soil is exposed to the sun, the more oxidation uh, that there will be of, of, of soil carbon. Um, as we move deeper down into the soil, uh, uh, the, or the much more stable organo mineral complexes form. In other words, fusions between organic matter and, and the minerals in the soil and the products of you know, the living and dying interaction with the soil microbiology. So as we go deeper down, this carbon in the soil becomes more and more stable. And this idea of translocation is the more we can study, the more longer term, deep down, we can store carbon in soils, there will be a longer, much more significant long-term benefit and a dampening effect of the climate, um, the climate change effect. So this is just something to be borne in mind. The less we disturb this uh, surface area of the soil, um, the, uh, the more we can, um, over time, facilitate this translocation of carbon. And these are just things we need to keep in mind as I, I feel like these are long-term goals and what we're hoping through this kind of education and, and true permaculture is we can inspire really many millions of people, billions of people around the world to be working in, in the same way towards these same kind of goals. Then anyway, so one of our lessons from nature um, is that everything cycles is we think we're using up things and uh, uh, and in fact that is only kind of temporary so let's just explore this journey here of carbon it's carbon in the atmosphere carbon dioxide part of the atmosphere part of what we're breathing and out um, and as plants photosynthesize they draw in uh, carbon dioxide and they lock the carbon part up into the tree and release the oxygen which they don't need which uh, is very useful to us <laughs> um, and obviously some of that tree is going to live and die be eaten by caterpillars and beetles and birds and things which in the process returns that carbon to the atmosphere so you can see that there's a kind of a quick return carbon cycle happening at this level and then there's a slower return carbon cycle happening on another level where some of that carbon is going to get incorporated into the soils and stick around for much, much longer, um, and maybe get translocated down deep into the soils before eventually um, perhaps being returned again by uh, other, other actions. Um, and here, of course, in this diagram, they've, of course, incorporated... Um, the carbon dioxide and methane are, are coming off from animals and also carbon dioxide coming off from burning fossil fuels in our tractors. And you can think about how this store of carbon in the soils is, as we interact with it, becomes part of the cycle again, a part of the carbon cycle again. And in this diagram um, is also actually pointing out that this carbon will cycle on over millennia, over many long periods of time as well so in this diagram we're looking at a cross section of the earth and we're seeing the earth's mantle and we're seeing here look where there's uh calcium carbonate CaCO3 an organic um carbon that's been deposited on the seabed and here's our um our coal seams and uh, maybe old soil and peat and ultimately the tectonic plates of the of the earth are moving uh, around and there are places where there's, they call it subduction, but where one plate is going down under another, it's pushed back into the mantle where it melts. 
and the carbon that's been worn down into the man mantle into the mantle can't stay there it's because it, it it expands and comes out through volcanoes so we, there's a long term of millions of years carbon cycling going on as well so it's, it's very interesting to think about how the, there's very short term medium term long term and really hyper long term carbon cycles going on and the problem is that what the, the climate problem is that we've as humans we've interacted with the system we've mined down into these stored um uh, uh, forms of uh, coal and limestone and that's what we've used to power our industrial revolution and that's what has triggered the climate change problem and that's why this is something we need to pay attention to in the long term bigger picture okay Let's there's there's a few sort of opening thoughts there and um, yeah let's let's take a pause so uh, thank you for listening to that and I, and I hope that you'll take the time to go through that again and also to think about um, you know come up with some of your own examples and you can always add to that story there's so much more to add um, these are just my kind of opening thoughts so I hope you found that useful. And uh, we will come back uh, to look at what is a forest.